Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dr. Smith, welcome back. Good to have you with us on this fine day. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Angela. Welcome back to everybody. Uh, I know we just prayed, but um, I want to pray just a quick prayer again, so if you'll join me in this month of Immaculate Mary, just a quick Hail Mary uh, for the church for our study tonight. Shall we? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And indeed, St. Augustine, pray for us. And what Pope Benedict called the normative theologians, that St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I was just telling Angela privately, I have a couple images to show you. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence for an oral Pentateuch and show you a couple really cool things about the Hebrew language. We'll do that later um, in the hour. But let's just kind of pick up where we were off, where we left off last week. Last week, we spent a good deal of time looking at the documentary hypothesis. What we want to do tonight is offer what I think is a fair and substantial critique of the hypothesis. And the way that I want to do that is to kind of move beyond the hypothesis itself and look at evidence from both scripture and tradition, um, as well as from history, to try to show you uh, what I think are some major pieces of evidence that point towards the unity of the five books of Moses. And then time permitting at the end, I want to talk a little bit about some early 20th century responses to the question of Mosaic authorship. So let's dive in. Uh, last week, uh, and on the outline, we left off on around page five. We've gone through the major tenets. Hopefully you had a chance to look that over. We looked at some of the dating, and I don't want to go back, I don't want to go back again to the dating or to the particularities of the hypothesis. We could go on for literally weeks, I mean every night, and still you know plunge deeper into this hypothesis. Hopefully, at least you have the basic understanding. I do want to mention one thing though uh, about the hypothesis uh, before we really get into tonight's presentation, and that is. Some of what I mentioned at the end of last week has to do with a certain ideological um, set of suppositions that are underneath this kind of German liberal understanding of the Pentateuch. And I'm talking about not only Wellhausen, who was a, a liberal German Protestant, but also the whole sort of German liberal skepticism movement. Um, and in particular, there is a kind of um, critique that lurks behind the documentary hypothesis. And some have gone so far as to call that an anti-Semitic critique. We talked a little bit about that last week, and I had a quote from Frank Moore Cross, who suggests, among others, very well-respected 20th century scholar, that we do have some of this anti-Semitism. What do I mean? Well, um, we talked just briefly a little bit about some of the politics going on in Germany surrounding what was happening with Wellhaus and the so-called culture conf in Germany. Um, without putting too fine of a point on it, we can see that not only in biblical theology, but in philosophy, in literature, and certainly in, in political and social circles, um, there was a lot happening around, swirling around the, the time that Wellhausen was working. And so when you look at the details of the documentary hypothesis, it's very hard to not see how some of this creeps in. And I think one of the main concerns that we ought to be very alert to that's in some of this stuff is this notion that the documentary hypothesis, at least most of its proponents really suggests that there's a kind of a fabrication that is taking place. Right? So we talked about how Wellhausen himself 
did not suggest this, but others who followed him suggested, for example, that rather than King Josiah discovering the book of Deuteronomy, which we read about in 2 Kings, alas, they found the book of the law. Most people believe that relates to the book of Deuteronomy. That some of the um, German Protestant scholars who were purporting this documentary approach actually suggested that the Josianic reforms, that is to say the reforms happening under Josiah, were not so much a rediscovery of the law, but you might say an implantation. Some might even say a kind of a fabrication of the law. In other words, look what we found, right? And then, you know, it was actually his scribes who under his mandate, basically, you might say, developed the book of Deuteronomy. Well, that, that's, that should be something that gets our, our attention and causes us to say, hmm, I don't think this really squares with a Catholic understanding of biblical theology. The book of Deuteronomy is simply some fabricated, made to look or sound like it's something that was rediscovered, written by Moses to lend credibility to the political reforms and religious reforms that Josiah had in mind. Okay, that's one example. Another example is the way um, Wellhausen and others disdained the priesthood. If you think back to what we said last time, that this uh, the so-called peace source, that is to say the priestly source, was for Wellhausen and for many of the source critics, the last written source, okay? But we're talking about after the exile, the theory goes, right? After the Babylonian captivity is brought to an end that this small school of elite priests in Jerusalem, so the theory goes, took all these traditions that were already in place, the J and the E source that had been stitched together, the D source, and then took their own materials and brought that essentially into the form that we call the Pentateuch now. Okay, So far, so good, or so far, so bad, whatever you want to say. But what Wellhausen believed is that what this small elite group of Jerusalem priests were essentially doing was hijacking what was otherwise a kind of religion of widows and orphans and justice that was not in uh, intrinsically all that much different than any other ancient religion that promoted, you know, the good of society and welfare for the poor and stuff like that. That basically Wellhausen believed that this small school had completely turned uh, what was developing as Judaism on its head and made it sort of this bloodthirsty cult that was focused on priesthood, and temple sacrifice and temple legislation and all this stuff. And it's, it's not hard to take away from that then, this, this impression that one gets that in addition to this hypothetical puzzle that the source theory purports to answer, we have a kind of a, a degradation of the Old Testament religion itself. Right? That's really what we have going on here is a kind of giving really the book of Leviticus, the priesthood, a, a kind of a black eye in no uncertain terms. Wellhausen was very clear about this, and so were some of his, um, his students who followed after him, that had it not been for this priestly source, you know, Judaism would have looked very differently. Well, yes, it would have if you take all of that stuff, not just Leviticus, but all the priestly code, Aaron, all the stuff out of the scripture, right? And that also affects then how some of these biblical theologians then looked at uh, at Jesus in the New Testament. And I argue in my book, The House of the Lord, that if you approach uh, the Old Testament with this kind of skepticism about the priesthood and this kind of very tainted view, it's not too far to go from there into a kind of very tainted view of the New Testament. Um, and as I argue in my book, Brian Petrie has argued this in some of his own um, scholarship as well, that that's exactly what you find in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, really a lot of the way through the 20th century is a kind of overlooking of this notion of Jesus the priest. And if you're interested more on this, and I'm not just trying to plug my book here, I do, I do talk for a good maybe five, 10 pages in detail about this. So there are dangers not only to the Old Testament, but also to missing the point that Jesus was instituting the new priesthood, right? Again, if you're Wellhausen and you're basically saying that the priestly source was a Johnny-come-lately, that it unfortunately tainted otherwise this kind of pure religion uh, of, you know, prophecy and social justice. And so that basically, you know, if Wellhausen had his druthers, the Pentateuch would have looked something like the Book of Amos. And that's not a critique of the Book of Amos, right? It's simply to say that you, you kind of vacuum out of the, 
of the older sources, which he believed were more pure, more pristine, something that's very anti-priestly, anti-temple, okay? So that's where we left off last week. Now, as I said, what I want to do now over this next half hour or so is present to you some of the positive evidence that Wellhausen's approach simply does not track when everything is taken into account. Now, the first thing um, we can say, um, and this is also Umberto Casudo's starting point, are the divine names. For Wellhausen, this was a sure sign that we have distinct theological viewpoints, right? Conflicting, incongruent, really combative viewpoints within the Pentateuch, right? If you've ever uh, watched the Israeli Knesset on TV, it can be very humorous, right? It makes our Congress look very sedate. Okay, that's kind of how Wellhausen, ironically, saw this whole work coming together, that there's all of this kind of antagonism, right, within this larger body of, of ancient Judaism, right? Infighting, different theological points of views, contradictory points of views, all somehow being kind of pasted together. Well, what Umberto Casuto, I think, really uh, showed in a very beautiful way, as well as a number of other very fine theologians in critiquing the documentary hypothesis, is that what we really have in the use of the divine names is uh, really a demonstration of the majesty and, you might say, diversity in the Godhead, if I can put it that way. We've got many different divine names, right? In, in fact, El Elyon, uh, one of my own favorite names for God, is one of the oldest names for God in Israelite religion. And it's often used to describe God when he appears in these mountain scenes, like at Mount Sinai, right? God Almighty would be the translation, or God of the mountain. Uh, we have Yahweh, right? We have many different names. So we have, we, we have to take account of what, the, of what the biblical author is doing, is using a precise theological term to tell us something different about the God who is behind this relationship with his people, right? And so, for example, the Elohim and Yahweh names, right? The, what, what, what Wellhausen called the Elohist source and the Yahwist source, in my view, are not necessarily any evidence of different sources with different theological ideologies. But what they do certainly represent are different dimensions of God. But I think the way we ought to see this is as follows. When we see the name Elohim, uh, what we're reminded of in the text is this uh, transcendence of God, right? When Elohim is used by itself, right, it reminds us of this grandeur and majesty of the God who created the universe. It has this kind of prefix or root of El, which is also what many of the Canaanite peoples referred to as God when they meant God or the, or the divine, right? So there's a very, very ancient pedigree. It's this kind of universal name for God and speaks to his majesty. On the other hand, this divine name, which God reveals to Moses, right? I am who am, is the Lord God's own personal name. And when we see in the text the name Yahweh, when it's used to, to designate God, we, what we often see is not so much the transcendence of God, but the flip side, the nearness of God. It's Yahweh who walks into the garden, right, and confronts Adam. Adam, what have you done in the cool of the day? Or uh, revealing the name to Moses at the burning bush. In contrast, it's Elohim that is used in Genesis 1 as opposed to Genesis 2. So I think that's all I want to say about that, but what Wellhausen believed was the smoking gun for these different sources, I think is a much more, you know, Occam's razor explanation that this one unified text is showing us not just these two divine names, but many other names for God alongside those two very important names, which convey and communicate the richness of who our God is. Okay. We talked a little bit about repetitions I don't think we need to be overly concerned about those. You know, Wellhausen believed, as others before him did, that this was another sign that we've got pieces being stitched uh, together. But let me show you a very interesting set of repetitions, okay? Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. This is a very interesting one that Umberto Casuto talked about. Now, while you're turning to Genesis 6, we know that 
in what's called the primeval history, Genesis 1 to 11, we get the story of creation, creation of man, the fall, right? And then we're on into the story of the children of Adam and Eve, right? Cain and Abel, and then essentially the flood story. Then following that, we get the Tower of Babel, and then finally it closes out with that in Genesis 11. So Genesis 6 through 9 is the story of the flood. Now watch this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. This is prior to the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth. Now watch this. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, turn with me over to Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. This is after the flood. God makes his promise to Noah. Uh, Beginning in verse 20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. By the way, this is the first altar that's mentioned in the scriptures. Noah's a priestly figure, right? And took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered them burnt offerings on the altar. Now watch this, verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the imagination of men's heart is evil from his youth or continually. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but what we have is both before and after the flood, a kind of repetition. And what that repetition is in Genesis 6, 5 and 8, 21, before and after the flood, is that the evil in men's heart is evil continually, yes? They, almost the same language, almost word for word in the Hebrew. So what this should tell us is that there's something going on in the flood story here, right? Wellhausen would say, this is an example of two different sources. No, what it shows us is that if we think the flood story of Genesis 6 through 9 is simply about God punishing sin, then, and I'm being facetious, God did a pretty lousy job of managing that, right? Because it was about getting rid of all of this evil. Why is it that you have almost exactly the same phrase after the flood as before the flood, Genesis 6, 5 and 8, 21? Obviously, God redeems Noah and his family, the eight on the earth, because of their righteousness, but the text is telling us it's not as though original sin has been eviscerated from the hearts of men. Otherwise, how do we get all the evil that happens at the Tower of Babel, right? Let alone everything else that follows after, all the ways that Israel is very wayward. Noah was a just man, but there still was that wounded nature in Noah. And so what we have is a kind of indication that the flood story is not as much about a punishment of sin but something very, very different. So look at Genesis 8, verse 1 with me. And here we read the following. But God remembered Noah. And to remember, at least in theological terms, in the language of the Bible, is more than just recollection. Like, oh, I remembered I have an appointment with the dentist tomorrow, right? No, it means receiving favor in God's sight, right? It's a Hebrew way of saying being in right relation to God. So why does God remember Noah? Well, you got to go back and read the story. But what we see is like Abraham before him, right? Noah is a just man or like the character Job. Okay. Now here's one more point about the, uh, the flood story. Genesis 8.1 is the very center of the flood story. Um, it's called a chiasm. What a chiasm is, it kind of looks like an hourglass. I don't know if I can draw this out for you very sparsely, but... I think you all know what I mean by an hourglass, but just so we're all on the same page, right? An hourglass. Okay, so Genesis 6 through 9 is a chiasm. That is to say, an extended text that has a unity in the very center. Some of you may have to go back to like high school days where you learned about chiasms, right? Remember you have something at the beginning and at the very end of a poem, for example, or you see this in Shakespeare or other writings, right? You have a repetition from the beginning to the end. So you have A and A1. Let me write these out here. A and A1, right? You have B and B1, right? C and C1. So you follow what I'm saying? So you have something at the beginning and a repetition at the end. Then A and A1, B and B1, C and C1, D and D1, and so on. So you have this kind of correspondence, right, of things that seem to line up. And by the way, those two things that I mentioned are part of this chiastic structure. Genesis 6-5 does correspond to Genesis 8-21. It's almost the mere opposite of it. Okay, 
what happens in this chiastic structure, in this hourglass structure? Well, what happens is when you get to the very center of it, you find a piece that does not have a corresponding part. That's the center of the chiasm. Another technical word for this is a palostrophe. Uh, and a palostrophe is just an extended chiasm. Okay, why am I telling you this? Why I'm telling you this is because biblical authors in the Old Testament often used chiastic structures to, in a kind of hidden mystical way, leave at the very center of a chiastic structure one of their most important points. In fact, I would argue in this case, it's the most important point of the story. And guess what the very center of the flood story happens to be? You guessed it, Genesis 8.1. Now, Umberto Casuto talks about this in his commentary on Genesis, something that's much more accessible. I'm going to give you a, a name of a good scholar here. It's Gordon Wenham. Uh, he's a very good Protestant scholar. He's really done some of the best work on chiastic structures in Genesis, and he's got a very, very nice um, explanation of this in his commentary is the word biblical on um, Genesis, very good commentary. And he, he kind of goes through and gives all the evidence, all this literary evidence. I just gave you one of those pairs. Okay. Now, what's my point here? My point is that if you're looking at the flood story from the vantage point of all of Wellhausen's uh, approaches, you're going to go down a whole different rabbit trail of all these sources and conflicting agendas and, you know, the J source and the E source, when right before our eyes from the author itself is the key that I would argue unlocks the story of the flood. That it's not so much about the flood and God obliterating humanity, but about God bringing about a new creation with a new Abraham figure, this just man whose name is Noah. And in the very center of that story what we're told, it's like the you know, neon sign that the author wants us to see. It's that God remembered Noah. And by remembering, I mean that God favored, God chose Noah. God made a covenant with Noah. And that's exactly what we get in Genesis 9. You can look at the terms of the covenant, okay? So the point is that when we see repetitions in Scripture, we need not necessarily be um, thrown off by them or think, oh, gosh, that's that Wellhausen guy telling us that this just doesn't jibe, right? It's, it's someone took this piece and that piece and they stitched it together. No, often what we have is evidence of the human author and, of course, the divine author right, conspiring together to teach us in a, in, in a very clear but sometimes hidden way. We've got to look carefully at the text and see that there's a larger unity underneath it. Okay. Um, another example of the, of the repetitions that's much more obvious maybe to the eye for many of you, is when you read the Psalms. And I mentioned this last time. It sounds like a simple repetition, like it's just saying the same thing over and over. You look very, very carefully. You'll find that it, it turns a phrase just slightly. And so Robert Alter calls these intensifications. Uh, so on the surface, it sounds like the same thing, but it's not. It's an intensification of an idea often is what you get, right? So the repetitions that are in there, this whole idea just doesn't track and hold water in terms of um, being some evidence of these disparate sources, okay? Let's go on and talk about some others. Um, here's a question, okay? So if it turns out that Wellhausen was right, then the Pentateuch is not in its final form until when? Um, about the post-exilic times, let's say the 400s, right? Now, forgetting about Mosaic, about Moses' own input at this point, what we're, what we're left with here is a Pentateuch that's very late, okay? So let me talk about some of the problems with that. If the Pentateuch has not been brought about until long after Moses, we said the time of the monarchy, right, from about 1,000, remember that from the first night, 1,000 B.C. down to about, let's say, 450 B.C., give or take, okay? Now, that period of time is many things happening in there, but it's the period of the monarchy, and I'm talking here especially about David. So where is the evidence, if the Pentateuch is late, for the Davidic monarchy in the Pentateuch? In other words, okay, if it's written at the time long before the monarchy, fine. But if it's written during and after the monarchy, one would think that there would be various clues, kind of in the background there, that the monarchy is, is in place, right? However... There is no mention of King David in the text of the Pentateuch. Moreover, this may surprise you. Look it up. 
the term Jerusalem is not there. Now, to me, that's a problem, right? Because if you have these priestly sources, couldn't they have somehow taken this city that's right? After all, they're working in Jerusalem. These are like the Jerusalem elites. And yet we have no mention of the word David. We only have a kind of cryptic prophecy of kingship in the book of Deuteronomy, but no explicit mention of David's name, no mention of Jerusalem. The very first mention of the term Jerusalem in Scripture, in the canon, you ready for it? Is in Joshua, you can look this up, Joshua 10, 23. Now, we do have an earlier version of the name of Jerusalem embedded in the book of Genesis. It's in the story of Melchizedek, the priest king, and you can look at that in Genesis 14. The term that's used there is that he's the king of Salem. This was an earlier name of Jerusalem. Uh, before it was called Jerusalem, founded by David, you go back to the Jebusites, and it was called Jebush which was basically the city of the Jebusites, right, which David conquered. And before that, it was called Salem. So what you find in this ancient text is only the ancient name of the city of Jerusalem. Okay. Additionally, this this one really excites me because I'm a temple guy, is the term temple. Hekal, H-E-K-A-L in Hebrew is the term. Guess what? That does not occur in the Pentateuch. So if this priestly school is kind of, you know, bringing together in sort of this fabricating way their own theology, they're not doing a really great job of it because all they're doing is representing the patriarchal period, right? So these are, you might say, arguments from silence. In other words, there's no evidence in the text, strictly speaking, that is from a later period, okay? Um, another example, so we don't have the word David or the, or the we even not, and not just the word David, but this whole notion of the monarchy, it's just not there. You don't really get the, the cries for the monarchy until um, really the book of Judges, right? And then in the story of 1 and 2 Samuel, right, where the people in 1 uh, uh, Samuel 8 cry out for a king, that's the first mention. So that doesn't seem to track with, with Wellhausen's notion that the Pentateuch is a product of the monarchical times, right, of the monarchy. No mention of David, no mention of the monarchy, no mention of the temple. Instead, what we have are mentions of the tabernacle, right? Why wouldn't we have, if they're editing this document, some sort of illusion to the temple? Or not even the temple, but just to a permanent sanctuary. Again, only one prophecy of it early in Deuteronomy. Um, and it's a very cryptic form, but no mention. All, what we have instead is the, sanct- is the tabernacle moving around in the wilderness. Nothing of what we might say the period of the monarchy in terms of Davidic legislation. So no royal texts, nothing along those lines like we get in the, in the prophets or like we get in books like the Kings or things like this or um, when the temple is in fact there, okay? Now, again, I think this is a big problem for the documentary hypothesis because Wellhausen and the others are pushing a date long after the time of Moses, but yet all of the theological evidence within the text of the Pentateuch itself points to the earlier period. Not a kingship, right? But Moses the lawgiver. No real even hint or illusion of a coming monarchy. Um, No mention of David, even in a kind of cryptic way. No mention of the temple, only of the tabernacle from the earlier period. Okay, let's move on. Another thing that we don't see in, or another thing that we see, rather, in the Pentateuch is when we look at Genesis, is that it seems to correspond, the way the story is told, I'm talking here particularly about the creation story, okay? The way that story is told is told in a way that is very much parallel to the very ancient Mesopotamian creation stories that go back several millennia, okay? In other words, when you look at the story of the creation, and even the flood story itself, which we talked about a few moments ago, the the book of Genesis, specifically chapters 1 through 3, correspond to the way that the creation myths were told in the ancient pagan world. Now, what's significant about that? Well, if you have a text that's being continually redacted and developed in a time that's much later, 
would we not expect to see some hints, changes in language and style that represent the later thought? No, well, we, we might, but yet we don't see them there. So in other words, the creation story can be parallel to these other ancient texts and all the evidence that is in the Pentateuch, not what Wellhausen wants to say he believes is there, but what's actually there corresponds to the way that the creation stories were told from a much earlier period. So again, what I'm suggesting is that the evidence in the text itself points to a much more ancient document. You follow what I'm saying? And that's a problem for Wellhausen if he's saying it's coming from, you know, a thousand years later than, you know, the time of Moses. All right. I got so much here to say. It's like so much Bible, so little time. On page uh, six, I'll give you another example just to mention this one. In the, where it says number four, positive indications of antiquity. This is what we're talking about here, right? Um, some biblical scholars in the last 40 years have done comparisons between the book of Deuteronomy in ancient Hittite treaties. Now, what's interesting is that these Hittite treaties go back to about the period 2000 to 1000 BC, okay? And what you find, and you can see kind of go back and forth, is that Deuteronomy, largely speaking, follows the pattern that's in the Hittite treaties in terms of present style of presentation. I'm not saying the Bible is importing or or borrowing the theology or any such thing. I'm simply saying on a literary level, it looks and smells a lot like uh, the things that are found in the culture from the much later period, right? So you have in these Hittite treaties a prelude, I'm looking on page uh, six here, a prelude, a historical prologue, obligations of the vassal towards the suzerain, provisions for public reading, list of the divine witness to treaty, uh, curses and blessings. You find the very same pattern in the book of Deuteronomy. Right? And so basically what some have argued is that the, the book of Deuteronomy is following the literary schema of these ancient treaties and are, is presenting what's known as a covenant indictment. In other words, what Moses is doing in Deuteronomy is like hammering them and saying, you have failed to live up to the terms of the covenant along the same literary lines of these ancient Hittite treaties. Okay, now how does that help us? with our whole um, look at the uh, documentary hypothesis. Well, again, more evidence that the form, the shape, the style, the substance of Deuteronomy seems to comport with Hittite treaties and not something from a later period. Okay, now Wellhausen has answers for these things, right? He would say it's simply preserving these older traditions. But, you know, if you, if you find that convincing, fine. I just think that that's insufficient to say, well, it's just it's, it's retaining these older traditions no, we don't, find, we don't find evidence that Deuteronomy uh, represents a kind of legislation that comports with the 5th century when he says it was written, but in fact it looks like it was the product of a much earlier period. Does that make sense? So we're looking at Deuteronomy, or we're looking at Deuteronomy in the same way as Genesis, critically here and saying, you know, Julius, it's not adding up here. Um, let me give you another one. Okay, this one's really cool. Wellhausen said that the last source, you will remember, is what? The priestly source, right? All the stuff in Leviticus, and not just Leviticus, but like the later parts of Genesis that talk about the legislation for the tabernacle, Moses and Aaron, all that stuff, certain things in Numbers, all the kind of temple sacrificial stuff that's in there, right? Okay. That's the priestly source, according to Wellhausen. Okay. And the priestly source is post-exilic. Boy, am I glad we talked about dates a couple weeks ago so I don't have to explain what we mean by post-exilic, okay? Now, stay with me here for a moment. This is kind of cool. What Wellhausen presumed was that this priestly source, which is late, was the primary influence for the book of Ezekiel. Let me say that again. Because he presumed that the priestly source, all the priestly stuff that's in the Pentateuch, is late, Okay about the 5th, 4th century BC, after the time of the exile, that it was very fresh uh, in, the minds of, in the mind of Ezekiel and influenced Ezekiel's thought. But here's the problem. Wellhausen is simply wrong. It's true that Ezekiel is a post-exilic prophet. That's no doubt about that. Ezekiel's writing after the exile. No doubt about that. Everybody agrees about that. Right? Here's the problem. It is clear that Ezekiel um, is actually drawing upon the book of Leviticus, what, what Wellhausen would call the priestly source. I'm going to prove it to you. 
not the other way around, okay? So what I'm saying is that Ezekiel, which is a, which is a post-exilic prophet, right, is in fact dependent on the book of Leviticus, but he's also modifying it, right? Okay, so let me, let me get a couple of texts. Maybe this will be clear. First, oh, and I'm sorry, I made, I made a mistake there. What I meant to say is that the priestly source he believed was, I should say, dependent upon Ezekiel. That's a critical mistake I made. Shame on me, right? So you basically have the priestly source looking to Ezekiel, the prophet, right? Here's the problem. It's very clear that it's the other way around, right? That the priestly source of Leviticus, which is the older source, influences Ezekiel, who changes the thought of of Leviticus. So let's first look at Leviticus chapter 25. This is about the year of Jubilee, okay? So the Jubilee year, which is every 50th year, what's supposed to happen is that basically debts were canceled, okay? So let me read just a little bit of this in chapter 25, verse 13. It's more than that, but I'm kind of consolidating for time. Leviticus 25, 13 says, in this year of Jubilee, each of you shall sell to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor and if you sell to your neighbor, buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. According to the number of years after Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And so, so what's happening here is every 50 years, you have people being re- restored to their lands, okay? So if you have a person who's like an indentured servant or slave, they're, they're supposed to be, by Levitical law, released so they can return to their family. It's so basically returning people to their familial properties, okay? That's the basic idea of it. It has nothing to do with canceling the credit cards, or economic debt, that's mentioned elsewhere in Deuteronomy 7. Those are called the Shemitah laws. This is the Jubilee year every 50 years. The key word here is neighbor, right? It's talking about neighbors. Now, watch what Ezekiel does. He modifies the Jubilee legislation. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 46. Beginning in verse 16, watch how he takes the language that he's obviously drawing upon in Leviticus, but he changes it. Watch. Thus says the Lord God, Ezekiel 46, 16. If the prince makes any gift to any of his sons out of his inheritance, it shall belong to his sons. It is their property by inheritance. But if he makes the gift out of his inheritance to one of the servants, it shall be uh, his to the year of liberty, that is to the year of Jubilee. Then it shall revert to the prince. Now, the term prince is in reference to the son of a king. Okay, my point is that you don't have any mention of princes back in the book of Leviticus. It's not there because the kingship doesn't exist yet. So when, he, when Wellhausen made this grand statement that the, one of the primary influencers on the priestly school was Ezekiel. He was like the figure they looked to, and they're drawing him. So what we have to believe then is that they're looking at Ezekiel when they're writing Leviticus, and they're simply ignoring everything he's saying about princes, and they're leaving that out. It doesn't add up. It doesn't track, right? So here's more evidence from the text that demonstrates to us, I think, in a very persuasive and interesting way, that that book of Leviticus is much, much, much older than Wellhausen believed it was. So we have the book of Genesis, the creation story, the book of Deuteronomy, with its being very closely um, in literary form to the ancient Hittite treaties. And then we have this so-called priestly source, which is saying, hey, yeah, Ezekiel, let's grab his ideas and bring it in there, except they completely leave out what he's talking about. Instead of mentioning princes, which they could have, would have, they change it to neighbors. The, and we could go further, but the point is, when you start looking at all the evidence in the Pentateuch, or elsewhere, it doesn't add up with what Wellhausen is talking about. So I've given you a number of examples. But I want to give you one more, which I think you'll find very fascinating. Okay, let's talk about Hebrew for a minute. Hebrew, as we know, is the language primarily that the Old Testament was written in. We do have some sections in in Daniel uh, and a couple other books that are written, parts of it in Aramaic, which is a sister Semitic language. But in short, we have a book of, the, the books of the Old Testament were originally written in Hebrew. Okay. Now, what I'm about to show you is an image of the Masoretic text of the Old Testament. Okay. This is actually from the book of Ruth. This is the Hebrew text of the book of Ruth. 
course, we're reading Hebrew from right to left, not left to right, right? So we're reading this way, okay? This is not Braille <laughs> and all these dots above and below the letters. These are the vowels. Okay, so what we have here as I'm moving across the page in these substantial letters are consonants. For example, this one right here, which looks like a harp, is the letter sheen in Hebrew, okay? This is the letter patak, looks like a T underneath it, which is essentially our vowel A. Okay, now why am I telling you this? Just take a good look at this text. What you have is a text here of the book of Ruth in Hebrew, where you have all these consonants, these are the major scribbles right here, right? And then above and below the text, and I'm pointing these out here, right? The dot here, what looks like a T, all these marks here. Do you see them above and below the text here? Those are the vowels. Now, why is that important? Well, why that's important is that this vocalization or vowel system was developed by a group of Jewish scribes in about the year 950 to, a th let's just say, 1,000 A.D., A.D., not B.C., A.D., okay? This is long after the biblical period, right? So these are Jewish scholars committed to the Torah, committed to the text of the Torah, and they're the ones that are known as the Masoretes. Masoretes. That's where we get our phrase. You may have heard this, maybe not, but the, Ma the Masoretic text. If you go into a, a, a bookstore today and ask for a Hebrew Bible, what you're going to get is the Masoretic text. It's going to look very similar to what you just saw. You've got the consonants going across the page and then the uh, vowels above and below it. Okay. Way back in the time of antiquity, there were no vowels that were written on the page. Only those consonants, those larger letters going across. What the Masoretes did is they didn't add anything to the text. To them, that would be profaning the word of God. So they didn't add any new vowels. Like we have our letter for A, right? What they did, which is kind of clever, is they put the vowels to pronounce the text above and below the line in what looks like the Braille, right? The dots. They came up with that system. That was an innovation of these Masoretic scribes. Now, why did they do that? We're glad that they did. They did that so that future generations would be able to continue to pronounce the word of God properly, right? Do you ever look at a, a license plate that only has consonants, right? Like my license plate uh, has like an acronym of Sherlock Holmes on there, right? But it's only the, the consonants, right? But you can make out what it says because you already know the word Sherlock, right? So even without the con, you've seen this, right? Before Bears fan or whatever it is, okay. So the original Hebrew the original written Pentateuch only had those consonants, of which there were 22, right? 22 consonants. The Masoretes gave us these vowels after. So what happens as you're reading from right to left is you kind of go up and down like this, like a roller coaster, right? You look at the consonant, what's above it, how to pronounce it. You go on to the next one, so you do this kind of like swimming motion, okay? If they hadn't given us that, we might not have know how to pronounce the word Yahweh, right? Because it's actually... In the text, it's just Y-H-W-H, right? But what they gave us was the ability to pronounce it Yahweh. Okay, why am I talking about this? Well, because in 1947, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, guess what we discovered about the, uh, through the Dead Sea Scrolls? I'm going to show you here. I'm going to pull up on the screen for you an example of what's called the Great uh, Isaiah Scroll. Now, what you're looking at is what's known as the Great Isaiah Scroll. This was discovered in 1947, one of the first documents discovered of these ancient Jews known as Essenes, just about an hour outside of Jerusalem in the Qumran community. Okay, this is the book of Isaiah. Now, I know you most of you can't read Hebrew, maybe not all of you, some of you can't, but what do you notice that's different about the text that we just looked at? Do you see? There are no dots, right? Look at the letters here. There's nothing above and below the one. And you can see the font is a little bit different, right? It's, this is the, that sheen that we're looking at a moment ago, the S, or you can see it's a little bit different, but you can still see it's the same. You get the three marks there. So the, the script evolved, but it's the same letter. Only the consonants. Only the consonants. Okay, let me come back to you here. This is so exciting. 
Okay, so in the year 1000 AD, we have this group of Hebrew scholars that knows the text, and in order to preserve the proper pronunciation of the text of, of the Pentateuch, they developed this vowel system, and thankfully, they put it into the text. Again, the reason they didn't move apart the consonants and add and come up with a new letter is to them, that would be adding to the word of God. But they came up with these like almost like marginalists below the letter, above the letter. And for them, that was not messing with the text itself, right? You follow? Okay. But here's the point. What I showed you just a moment ago from the Dead Sea Scrolls was a copy of the book of Isaiah. Now, how much older is that book of Isaiah copied by the Essene community from the Masoretes? I told you the Masoretes were operating in Jerusalem, actually up in Galilee in about the year 1000 AD, coming up with their innovation, you might say, of the vowel system. That's now in our Hebrew Bibles, 1000 AD. When were the Essenes writing their scriptures? Between 200 BC uh, and 70 AD, okay? Now, simple math, that scroll that we just looked at of the book of Isaiah is 1000 years older than the oldest Hebrew Bible that we have. Let me say that again. That Hebrew text that we looked at for just a moment of Isaiah from the Essene community, the Jews at uh, Qumran, from this sectarian group, their text of Isaiah and of all the books of the Old Testament were without vowels. In other words, it simply didn't exist in the text back then. And so when you compare the text of, let's say, Genesis from the Essenes, which we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the oldest Hebrew Bible that we have, which is called the Aleppo Codex from 1000 BC, 1000 AD, what we find is that it's the same text. The difference is that we now have the vowels. Okay, now here's why this matters. How did those Masoretes know how to pronounce the Bible? How did they know? In fact, let let me ask another question. How did Jesus know how to pronounce it? Remember when he opens the scroll of Isaiah? If there's only consonants there, how did he on earth know what he was pronouncing or anyone else reading those scrolls? If all you have is consonants, that's what the Hebrew Bible was originally, just consonants, right? How far do you think you would get? How far do you think you would get just in English if we took all the vowels out of uh, the book of Genesis? Well, some of it you might know by memory, but a lot of you be like, I don't know what this means. There's no vowels. And here's what I'm getting at. Wellhausen is proposing that what we have is a written tradition or traditions behind the Bible, right? And these different written traditions were stitched together over time. And yet what I've just tried to explain to you and shown you is that from history, we have now seen that the way that the Bible was substantially preserved, wait for it, this is the money quote of the night, was not in written form, but in oral form. This was an oral culture. Now, I'm not saying that the text of the Pentateuch did not develop over time and was not, was not put into written form. Of course it was. Of course it was. What I'm simply saying is that the primary mode, the primary mode of preservation was not written, but oral. Okay, turn with me to one last scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the great prayer of Judaism, the great prayer of, known as the Shema, right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, I think you all probably know what I'm getting at here. Verse 3, hear, therefore, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, verse 4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one Lord. And it goes on, right? So it talks about writing it down and all that, but what's the first thing it says? Hear. That prayer is bespeaking how the text was largely transmitted from generation to generation to generation to generation. Orally. I'm not saying the written text wasn't necessary, but in a manner of speaking, what the written text was was almost the crib note. So when you opened up the Bible, what you had before you was that which you already knew. And how did you learn it? Well, the Shema talks about that, right? It was taught 
They weren't focused on Breaking Bad and TV and texting and Facebook and social media, right? They were focused on the word of God, which was firstly oral and then written. So what I'm suggesting is that when you put all of the evidence together, right? Firstly, the written evidence itself of the Pentateuch bespeaks a much older text than Wellhausen's talking about. Secondly, the text overall has much, much, much more unity than disunity, right? In fact, I would argue when you look at it as a whole, what you see really is a body of unified text, not a disunity. And then the last major point I want to make tonight is even the way that the Hebrew Bible was passed down from generation to generation depended primarily, primarily, not on the written word of God, but on the word of God that was preserved on their hearts, taught in the homes, taught from rabbi to student, from father to son. It was an oral culture that preserved and retained the inspired word of God in their hearts. And the written text is really only secondary. And the same is true with the gospels, right? We move from an oral gospel to a written gospel, okay? So all in all, I think there is tremendous reason to to criticize or critique that hypothesis known as the documentary hypothesis. It's taught us a lot, and yet there are such immense holes in it that I think we need to come back to our senses and realize that this hypothesis is only a hypothesis. And I want to quote Pope Benedict, who said in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, what we need now are not more, I'm paraphrasing, not more hypotheses, right, but more understandings of the theology of the Word of God. Now, just very briefly, and then we'll take a couple of questions. On page eight, okay? So let's just kind of in a minute or two wrap up, what does the Catholic Church say about the authorship of the Pentateuch? In other words, where does all this leave us, right? Certainly, I think this whole notion of oral Torah that I just closed with should tell us that what we have is not only a unified text, but a text that was not dependent upon various written sources, but was transmitted orally, and yes, also written, going back substantially to the time of Moses. Okay. Now, I'm going to let you read all the, uh, the, uh, the verbatim here on page 8 and 9, but what I've given you is from the Pontifical Biblical Commission. In 1906, which was uh, started by Pope Leo XIII, the Pontifical Biblical Commission was, was asked by Pope Leo to investigate, because of these speculative theories like the documentary hypothesis, what should we say about mosaic authorship? Okay, so here it is. It's in question and answer format. Are the arguments gathered by critics to impugn the Mosaic authorship of the sacred books designated by the name of the Pentateuch of such weight, in spite of the cumulative evidence of many passages of both the Old and New Testaments, the unbroken unanimity of Jewish people, etc., etc., such that these books are not of Mosaic authorship, but were put together from sources of a post-Mosaic date? In other words, the question that the PB is asking half of the Pope here, these theologians, is, Are we to believe that the Bible, the Pentateuch, only came together after the time of Moses? Their answer, in the negative. In other words, they're affirming in this uh, explanation, 1906, that we should and do indeed affirm that these texts go back to the time of Moses. Now, the next question, question number two, um, concerns written in Moses' own hand. Was it written in Moses' own hand? Or can we also infer that there may have been, this is the third line here, the work of himself under the guidance of divine inspiration, and then entrusting the writing to one or more persons with the understanding that, I'm paraphrasing here, that they may have developed it somewhat. And the answer, in the negative to the first and in the affirmative to the second part, what does that mean? The PBC is saying, yes, the, the text goes back to Moses, but the church is not denying here that there was maybe let's say some modest redaction. One example is what Father mentioned at the beginning, right? We don't have to hold that because the Pentateuch says about the death of Moses that Moses had to prophetically write that. That would be kind of the Catholic fundamentalist view. In other words, the the church is saying here that the fact that there may be some modest redaction or editing after the death of Moses, right, is allowable. That's very different, I hope you see, then what Wellhausen is saying is that the whole thing, whole enchilada, is from after the time of Moses. What they're saying, without giving you a percentage, is that the majority of that pie goes back to Moses itself. And they're saying, yeah, there may be some instances, modestly, here and there, where there was a development after the time of Moses, 
by those who were holding to kind of like a disciple of Moses, even if it's generations after him, right? in kind of a mosaic school, okay? And you can read uh, the rest of the questions here. Number three, what about Moses using sources? In the affirmative. Yeah, Moses may have used sources. So what you actually get here in these questions from the Pontifical Biblical Commission is on the one hand a very, you might say, traditional response that ultimately the Pentateuch substantially goes back to Moses. So a full-throated affirmation of that. But what you also find in here, if you read it carefully, is some nuance. They're kind of saying, look, um, the text we, certainly goes back to Moses, but also it's saying that there may have been under the divine spirit some sort of development. Now, lastly, I would, I would leave you with what Ratzinger, Pope Benedict said about the composition of the Pentateuch. Number one, he, of course, affirmed and believed that what we have, largely, substantially speaking, is a text that certainly goes back to the historical figure of Moses. But he also believed that the Pentateuch reached its final written, written state around the time of the exile. But that's saying something very, very different, right, than Wellhausen is saying. And I hope you see that, right? It's one thing to say that we have these various competing schools with different theological points of views from the time of about 1,000 to the time of 400 B.C., that doesn't go back to Moses at all. And these competing points of view, we've got this priestly source, which is hijacking the Pentateuch. Okay, that's well awesome. And then we have Ratzinger saying, nope, goes back to the time of Moses, substantially Moses' author, but that the written text itself appears to have been reached its final canonical shape in, let's say, about the time of the post-exilic period. And I think that while there still are questions about how all of that developed, that we can sort of leave it there, I would commend to you the book by Umberto Casuto if you want the kind of full-throated uh, discussion. Uh, if you want something just a little bit further, I want to recommend again the introduction, the Catholic introduction to the Old Testament by Petrie and Bergsma. And they have about a chapter in the beginning, just came out, Catholic introduction to the Old Testament. They, they deal with some of the uh, information. They actually go through some of the stuff I talked about, like the Hittite Deuteronomy comparison, we go through the Ezekiel example in, um, in their discussions, well, and a lot more. And so they provide, a, I think, a very robust but very fair critique of the documentary hypothesis. Angela, turn it back over to you to see if there's any questions we can try to answer here. Sure. One person had asked if Wellhausen was using the original ancient Hebrew text um, for his hypothesis, or was he using a German translation of the Pentateuch? No, he did. I mean, he did know Hebrew very well. Um, I would say that. So he's, he's, he's not simply looking at the German translation. So we, we can't say that the problem was he wasn't looking at the text, okay? But as I pointed out, there are a lot of leaps that he makes. For example, so, you know, he just assumed, he believed that the priestly source was so late and that it's this late development that's kind of, you might say, hijacking a purer form of religion, okay? So much so that he believed that the book of Leviticus, let's say, was influenced by the prophet Ezekiel, as I gave in the lecture, rather than the other way around. But yet, when you look at the actual evidence for that, it doesn't track. So the problem is, is not so much that Wellhausen was, I mean, he's brilliant in saying that he wasn't. But the problem seems to be a set of suppositions. As far as I can tell, one of the, one of the I, I think, real criticisms that, that needs to be taken into account here is that he followed what might be called the history of religions school. In German, it's called religion Geschichte. Geschichte basically means history, right? History of religions. And this was kind of the mindset at the time. What this history of religions approach, Angela and everyone essentially said, is that religions are kind of like evolution. They evolve, right? It's like a snowball rolling down a hill and they pick up stuff over time. And it gets kind of weeded out. So, so his... You might say methodologically, yes, he knows the Hebrew mechanically and all of that. He's not relying just on his own German. So it's not a problem that he doesn't know how to read the text. It's what he does with those texts. And I think underneath his argument um, are, are some real blind spots. And I, I think, to be honest, again, one of the biggest concerns that I have is that he's not just doing justice to Israelite religion. He's making presumptions that the early, early Israelite religion, going back to the time of like, 
David is a much purer form of religion and that it kind of gets, you might say, corrupted by all this bloodthirsty sacrificial stuff, which he had a real distaste for, right? So I'm I'm kind of simplifying here, but when you read through Wellhausen, it's clear that he has a set of ideas for how this came about. And the same is true, by the way, with the New Testament source criticism. Maybe Father will invite me back another day. We can talk about the so-called two-source hypothesis in the Gospels. But a similar thing happens, right? So it's not just the Old Testament. This was happening in the 20th century with the theories about how the Gospels came together. And there's a lot of skepticism that was involved in that. And we're still dealing with the fallout of these. And again, do you see the fallout of this? I mean, if we're basically saying the book of Deuteronomy, according to some, was essentially fabricated, my oh my. Or that the priestly source was basically hijacking, you know, this earlier religion that was just all about, you know, care for widows and orphans until the priestly school came along and essentially said, no, we're going to turn this whole thing in another direction. So anyways, that's, that's a bit more than I intended to say, but um, how about another one? Uh, sure. Um, it, well, it was interesting because someone was asking if we knew whether or not Wilhelm was a believer. Since he considered sacrifice as a degradation of earlier and pure religion, what would he have possibly thought of the crucifixion? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, with all of these guys, it's really difficult to know what they believe because the very method of writing they they don't they, they kind of keep that close to the vest. Let me give you an, I, I I don't know off the top of my head just how much Wellhausen did or not. what I can't tell you is that his counterpart in the New Testament, uh, Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, some of the people may know that name Bultmann, German source critic of the New Testament, was a German Lutheran. He was actually a pastor. But see, what a lot of people say is these guys were you know were heretics. Well, what what's interesting is that Bultmann. In his own strange way, if you asked him, hey, are you a believer? He'd say, I'm, I'm Christian, right? I'm a Lutheran pastor. But see, what Bultmann was doing, which is also maybe what Wellhausen thought they were doing, was restoring religion. What, what we have in a lot of this 19th, 20th century criticism is that a lot of these critics believed that they had the acumen and the insight to restore the true religion before it had gotten um, made ecclesial, right, by basically the church. So what you have is they're trying to strip off what they believe is all the gunk that got added on over time. So Wellhausen, for example, when he looked at the Gospel of John, he had this whole developmental theory. All Guess what? All the sacramental stuff is very, very late. Not, not going back to John, right, all the stuff about the Eucharist, but that's from what he called the Kirche Redactor, the Church Redactor, right? Big surprise, all the kind of ecclesial sacramental priestly stuff in the Gospel of John, just like the priestly stuff in the Old Testament, is late, meaning not original, meaning not apostolic, you might say, right? So there's a kind of disdain, you might say, among a lot of these guys in which they believe, they really believe that they were restoring the purity of what these texts were about. But then you have to ask the question, what's purity according to them, right? It's very different than what we might say. Yeah. Time for one more? Uh, I think so. Jane, you have a question. Um, I was really struck by the word hearing. And then I remembered Roman, um, Romans ten seventeen about faith comes from what is heard. And I, I don't know, I was thinking of that. That has to be integrated into your whole being, what you hear. Yeah, so I hadn't really thought of that. But do you think that um, Wellhausen and all of those um, gentlemen were really more concerned with um, disproving Catholicism? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Let me take the first part first about the hearing. As I mentioned earlier, is, you know, my big problem here is that so much emphasis, an inordinate emphasis in this whole theory is placed upon written texts. And by the way, sources that they're speculating existed in time and then were lost. The same is true Right with the New Testament, if you have me back, I'll explain this. But with the Gospels, the presumption is that we have like this Q source, and then it was all important, and then it was lost. Right? Uh, how convenient, right? But but the point would the point would be that um, there's too much emphasis placed upon the written text in both the New Testament Gospels and the in this case the Pentateuch. And I'm not trying to diminish the written text. I'm not saying that, for example, of course Moses wrote the law down and all that. We know all that. But the point I'm making is that the primary way that the text was preserved was through hearing in the temple, in the synagogues, and in the home. 
And my point about showing you the Dead Sea Scrolls with this consonant-only alphabet was obviously when they were looking at the consonants, they knew how to pronounce it. I'm talking about, you know, Jesus, when he would have read the scroll, it would have only had those consonants. Now, accepting the fact that he's the son of God, how does he know what that text says? Because he's not reliant upon the written text the way we are when we open our Bible. The Bible was so much preserved by the, the scribes in the best sense of the word, right? Those who were the teachers of the word, the rabbis, it was all here and here. And the written part was only secondary. And by the way, we know that the gospels were written down only at the time when the apostles, St. Irenaeus tells us this, were going off to missionary journeys or were reaching near the end of their life. And we're concerned, hey, when we no longer have the ability to preserve it orally, it's got to be preserved in written form. So my, my point is that it's the transmission of the word of God orally that should point us back to the origins of the inspired word so that right. such the written text is as important as it is, and I'm not diminishing it, is in a certain sense secondary. We don't tend to think that way. And I think Wellhausen is very much a product of the Enlightenment period that looks as, at these texts as simply texts, simply written documents, not as this living tradition. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Right. Probably that's it, but I'm going to put a plug in. Uh, sometime 2019, whatever, I'd love to come back and talk about uh, the New Testament source criticism, because there's another whole situation we have with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that's, that's for another time. But it's been my pleasure to be with you over these last weeks. I hope that if you are joining tonight and didn't go get a chance to, to join one of the other two episodes, you go back on the website and go ahead and listen to them. And I hope to see you again uh, very soon, whenever Father may have me back. It's always great to be with you. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. I'll turn it over to Angela. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith. And uh, My pleasure. You'll, you'll all join us for the next couple of events. God bless. <laughs> Bye. Good night, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.